Welcome to Spiritual as Fuck. Spiritual as Fuck. A podcast where we explore everything outside of the ordinary. I'm Liz Volpe. I'm a social entrepreneur, now psychic medium, teacher and mentor, with a huge passion to inspire people to dream big and change the world. I'm Diane Driscoll, a coach, facilitator and speaker. I'm also a psychic intuitive, learning to incorporate my spiritual gifts into my life and business. We're here today to share real and raw spiritual stories. It's going to give you a safe space to challenge what's normal and have some serious fun along the way. We hope you're ready to get spiritual as fuck. Before even finishing the book Spirit Talker, Liz and I both knew that we just had to interview its author, Sean Leonard. This was a book that we both consumed at rapid pace and were deeply moved by. Sean Leonard is an Indigenous Mi'kmaq spirit talker and psychic medium. He lives in Millbrook First Nations Coal Harbour, Nova Scotia in Canada, and has been working as a professional in his field for over 25 years. At 16 years old, just one year after losing his father to a massive heart attack, Sean received a visitation and a message from his father in spirit. In the three decades since that night, Sean has finally honed his ability as a spirit talker and psychic medium. His gift has allowed him to help people all over the world as he communicates with departed loved ones, spirits and guides. Sean is a proud Indigenous Mi'kmaq person who works with spirit to heal hearts. He is the star and host of APTN TV show Spirit Talker, the author of Spirit Talker the book and Wisdom of the Elder Oracle Cards. He is also the founder of Spirit Talker Tribe online course. In this episode, Liz and I are deeply honoured to have Sean share his wisdom and that of his ancestors with us. As our first Indigenous guest, we seek to understand Sean's connection to ancient ways and his incredible gifts. You will hear the soul-stirring Mi'kmaq language, Sean's story of connection to spirit, and reconnection to ancient ways, as well as how Sean received his name, White Eagle Spirit Talker. So Sean, absolutely amazing to have you here all the way from Canada. (laughs) Thank you so, so much. And I just want to jump straight in here um, because I have posted this actually through the socials, but Diane and I recently read the Spirit Talker book, which was just just such a delight to read, I have to say. There's not many books that can kind of really capture my attention and I kind of speed read through them and absolutely enjoy every second. So thank you for that, Sean. Oh, you're um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you I'm really grateful stuff- that the book had found its way into your life and that it, you know, it touched you and hopefully inspired you to, you know, be greater, you know, connected yourself in your own ways and understanding a little bit of Indigenous wisdom too along the way. Oh, it it did. And I just want to tell and shout out that everybody needs to go and buy the book and we'll be putting the links in the show notes for it. But I want to start, I guess, right at the beginning of your story, um, which I just loved. You start to share this incredible story of having an imaginary friend who I believe is called Sam. And I remember having an imaginary friend being young as well. And I would love you to share how Sam came into your life and how that story kind of got started with him. Well, you know what? It's so strange with Sam. I don't I don't really remember when he came. He was just there. I remember, I, you know, everybody probably has very faint memories of being a very young person in life. Like I have very vivid memories of going back to like two years old. And my mom says, there's no way you should remember that. But I don't remember him around that time, but probably around three, maybe four. Then I realized I had somebody who was spending time with me. And, uh, you know, he, I didn't know that other people didn't know that he wasn't there or whatever. I mean, he was just a tall, I mean, I would say probably six foot, you know, something, you know, curly kind of dirty blonde haired fellow with a, piercing blue eyes. I mean, he was a non-Indigenous fellow and, and, uh, but he was my friend and it wasn't necessarily about, you know, what he was teaching me in life. It was just that he was with me and he was just helping me prepare me in a sense to engage in life uh, without being as spiritually connected at that time. And um, because I think when we're young, we all are uh, very spiritually connected. I think 
as we grow, we have to kind of disconnect to be in the world mm. because you can't walk around being as activatedly connected to spirit world and uh, still see the world as you need to, to embrace it the way we do. And um, I mean, the clearest memory I have, I mean, many arguments with my mom about him, <laughs> which is always <laughs> fun because my mom, you know, very, very devout Catholic, uh, you know, still goes to church, although I think her perceptions of that may have changed over the years, but, you know, still strong in her faith. And, you know, sometimes I tell her what Sam would tell me. It'd be very challenging to her belief system. Oh, and wow. So it was always like little arguments. And my mom, I remember clearly my mom saying like, you know, I don't know who the hell Sam is, but, you know, tell Sam he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, Sam told me this. Sam told me that. And, it's uh, kind of like a parent's I'm... worst nightmare, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, I, I think she just thought I just made up Sam just to argue with her. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, and, and you know, so, you know, time went on. And, and the most clearest memory I do have is the day that he left me, actually. It was the most vivid and um, it was so saddening because I, I had this friend that, you know, was a man who, for whatever reason, dressed in a long white robe and was hanging out with me all the time. And, you know, I'd play with my cars on the floor in my mom's basement. And, you know, I was just being a little boy. And he just chit chat with me and, and stand with me. And then he said, and I remember the conversation. He just said, Sean, you know, I'm I'm always going to be with you. you. You know, I'm always going to be here, but I have to go. I, I'm not. I can't be with you like this for the rest of your life. And I couldn't understand, like, why would you need to leave me? Like, why? It felt like you're, it was like parental abandonment of sorts. Oh, yeah. he, this huge white light just opened and I saw this light and he just walked into it. And like with a blink, he was gone. And I remember being down by the washer and dryer in my mom's basin and, and just going, Sam, Sam. Yeah. And I felt alone. I felt literally like I was like, a, there was nobody there anymore. And I just sensed this, just loneliness. And, uh, you know, I ran up, I was crying to my mom. I said, you know, Sam left and I don't know where he went. And he's, he said, he's, he's going to be here. And I was just really kind of traumatized by the fact oh. that Sam had left me. And, um, but I understand, you know, that he's still there. Obviously he's always been there. I think we have many guides that are with us. Mm, he was yeah. probably my primary guide. And, um, you know, I, I still sense him here and there, but, you know, throughout the years of my growth and my, and my, my spirit work, uh, in connection to my culture and everything, you know, my guides have, I've, I've, I've learned about even more guides and some of these other guides, uh, particularly like Victoria that I have in my life right now, you know, she, she's been there always as well, but, you know, I feel like at different phases or stages of life, we may need a guide that is particularly fond or good at a particular skill. And yes. they may be best to guide us through whether it's, you know, speaking in public or, or teaching people, or and there, there's different guides that can work with us in different ways. You know, that we obviously have a life plan, a life chart, you know, that we come here to kind of fulfill, to express, to become the people that we are. And uh, Sam is that for me. He's mm. the guy who's like keeping me on track. But, you know, when it comes to other things in life, like the spiritual work, I've, I've learned about other guides as I kind of mm. went along this journey. And it's been pretty amazing. And, you know, is equally as connected as I am to Sam. And and I, I hardly hear him to tell you the truth, even to this yeah. day, but I won't call him my new guy, the guy that I became more aware of later, <laughs> <laughs> that Victoria, I hear her more. Um, I hear her more and more um, guiding me with the work that I do pre predominantly. Oh, yes. I have to I have to admit Sean when I came to that part in the book I cried I literally had to stop because I was listening on audible I was crying as Sam left you just and even to hear you now speaking about it because on audible it's your voice but hearing now you're you're, you're relaying the information in real time it's like I can feel it coming up that sense of abandonment from that little boy and it's not that someone leaves you it's almost like they take a step back they're just that little bit further removed from you but you know that they're there it's interesting because those early stages or Sam was someone from your um spiritual realm that was a guide and a mentor for you but your grandmother the role that your grandmother played in your life and, and I know that the, the, some of the words that were in the book was because of her heritage saying to you you know your are ma right um like that every time that was said in the book I just absolutely lit up it's like just 
infusing from that early stage about your heritage even though it wasn't something that was you know part of your everyday life at least not that real ancient wisdom can you talk a little bit about your your grandmother and just your I guess your connection to your indigenous heritage from those early stages in your life and how that was forming for you right I mean as a young person um I mean we we don't see color or, or race. I mean, yes. you know, it's something that it's something that we're taught, right? In a sense, right? We we see every people as people, mm-hmm. and uh, that's how my mom generally uh, helped me see that. But it was really my grandmom who kind of helped me understand culturally yeah. who I was and the importance of that, you know, for for my understanding and 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 to be proud of that. Even though my grandmom uh, was Mi'kmaq from Newfoundland, Canada. And she, and, and, and when she grew up, I mean, she was very young, you know, Newfoundland wasn't even part of Canada because, you know, Confederation and, and, and joining was part of the, the British colony or something like this. And yeah. then eventually, I think it was 1948 that they joined um, part of Canada. But there was no real like, because in Canada, we have what you call indigenous communities like reserves, you know, that have yes. been formed by the government. And back in the day of my grandma, that that didn't exist, you know, but there was communities of people that kind of uh, you know stuck together and and the Mi'kmaq people were were those people and there was a lot of stigma back in the day you know in relation to indigenous people and and you know it was a lot of hardship that indigenous people went through and my grandma married a, a Caucasian fisherman because it's Newfoundland I mean he, yes. he, and he has Irish and you know there's Irish roots there just so you know I wanted to know that especially with the name Sean I said it to Liz I said there has to be an Irish connection there, <laughs> there is, <yeah. laughs> and uh, so you know and so even though she was married to my grandfather and uh, they had a huge family 16 children you wow know, back today, I mean wow. that's what you did you you know the church was really happy you know you go go forth and procreate. <laughs> and uh, my grandma did an amazing job. I actually feel it was a bit of a competition in the little town that she was in. Who's going to have the most children? And uh, she was beat by one of the neighbors and she had 18 or something like that. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> I know. I know my, my mom was the oldest. And uh, anyway, my grandma in Newfoundland, there was a place called Con River in, in indigenous language is called Mabugek, which is, um, you know, a very small community there. And she left there very young in life because, you know, back in the day, you didn't stay with your family very long. Usually around 15, you were married and you started to have children. And that that's just how life was. And she had done that. And, you know, even though she was with her people at that time at a very young age, uh, and there, one of the people that helped raise her was uh, a lady named Kitty Burke. And Kitty Burke was in that community, one of the last uh, medicine women who she actually, even up till um, I think in the 19 somethings was still living in a wigwam. Like she refused wow. to move into a house and she was a traditional medicine yes. woman who would go pick medicine and she was living by the old way. So literally thinking in, in regards to indigenous culture that, you know, in my family, only two generations away, you know, we were living in wigwams and, and, and still, um, you know, very much who we are as indigenous people. And, you know, everything changed, of course, with, you know, colonization and such. And, uh, you know, she she was like really fickle on moving out. But she would teach my grandmom certain things about medicine and, you know, herbal medicine and a little bit about culture. But, you know, being so young and leaving the community, my my grandmom, uh, because I, again, didn't see a color or, or anything like that or race. She would always say, you know, sh- you know, Sean, you know, you, you know, you're Mi'kmaq, right? I'm like, I guess so. I mean, I didn't know what even what Mi'kmaq yeah. meant. What does it mean? Right. Yeah. Right. I didn't even know, have an idea of what that even meant for me. And, you know, my grandma uh, lost most of her language because of uh, leaving so young in life. And as, you know, later on in life, I started to learn more and I would go back because she lived in Newfoundland, still in a small community. And I was so happy to go back uh, later in life and, you know, meet uh, my grandma, because we used to play cards like all the time and I spent all summers with her and, you know, and she would tell me ghost stories. And, you know, I remember very vivid, like she was kind of, she was a bit strange. Like she, she loved horror movies. So we just watch <laughs> horror movies all the time. It was like, <laughs> she was not scared of nothing, but she was still very spiritually connected. And I feel like that there's an element of her understanding the spirit world, probably greater than many people realize. 
and mm. because of that culture heritage and that that you know being familiar with uh, the spirit world because it's very much part of our culture as indigenous people yes. and um she would tell me stories and we would just sit there and, and she, she smoked too so I, I was very young a smoker at that time because i'd roll her smokes and she'd be like playing cards and then she'd give me a cigarette for rolling her eventually i had to quit mind you in my early 20s because i was like this is going to kill me <laughs> But, you know, amazing memories with my grandma. And then I would share the language that I would learn throughout the years. I would, you know, say, I don't only learn little phrases, little words, and I go back and she goes, that sounds so familiar to me. And, but she wouldn't know what it meant. So I'd had to tell her. And then, uh, unfortunately, my grandma, as she got older, she started to get dementia. And uh, so it was very hard for her to remember anything at that point. And, and as the years went on, it just got worse and worse. And, you know, and I remember even the, one of the last conversations I had with her, I said, you know, Nan, I mean, who, who's your favorite grandson? And she goes, of course you are, Sean. I mean, she's got a oodles of grandchildren. Oh. <laughs> I said, you know, I said, Nan, I said, when, you know, your, your journey is going to be coming soon to the spirit world. So it was nothing that she was uncomfortable with. Yeah. And um, she'd even go to me for spirit connection sometimes. And wow. I remember. How once, amazing is I, that? Yeah, it was because she realized that I was pretty connected and um, back in the day. And she actually, my after my grandfather passed, he passed a long time ago, one year after my father. But she had met another fellow uh, named, what was his name? I can't remember his name. He's irrelevant now. But uh, she met another fellow who I never actually got to meet. His name was Chess. Okay, thank you, Spirit. So see, I love it when spirit tells me stuff because it's just like, I can't remember sometimes when <laughs> they, have tap, to actually put, they have to put it in my brain. <laughs> and I think most of us don't even realize that's happening sometimes that yes. spirit's communicating to mm -hmm. us, right? And it's when you become aware of it's just not there. And all of a sudden it gets, gets put in there. You're like, where does that come from exactly? Because I've stopped thinking about it already and it just yeah. popped in there. Yeah. Now, um, so chess, she, she, you know, because my grandma, she had 16 children. She had a bad hip from having so many children. She actually, I think they they said she got rickets in her hip or something like that. And she had to have, and she was very scared of surgery. And she actually came to me back in the day and said, Sean, you know, I'm so scared. I said, Nan, you're going to be fine. I, and so she went and got the surgery. After the surgery, she said, oh my God, if I knew it was going to be that easy, I would have done a long time ago. Because then after my grandfather uh, passed, it allowed her to go to dances and meet people. And I mean, she was a mom from like, the age of 15 so till young. like, mm -hmm. and, you know, so young. And then she, you know, kind of lonely as well, just raising you know, even a few uh, of my, my nephews and such like this. Cause again, family was like, she, even though she raised her children, she was raising other children on top of it that uh, she got to get out and live life a little bit. Aww. And she met chess dancing and they had an amazing relationship for, I don't know how many years. And uh, unfortunately he ended up having cancer and passing away as well. And mm -hmm. I remember when I was there, is her dementia got really bad and and we were sitting outside. It was her birthday. I think it was probably her 84th birthday. We were outside sitting in lawn chairs on, on a cement step and it was a beautiful sunshiny day. And she, she goes, you know, Sean, she goes, I wonder if chess is still around me. And I looked behind her and there was this long beam of light about the size of a person. It was the enormously bright like just like a stream of light was just standing right behind her and i'm like well i'm pretty sure you're still with you <laughs> just how do you know like i can i can freaking see and stand up behind you <laughs> and, she goes, and it's oh, lovely even not to have to call him in he's just there he's around he you. was just there <laughs> i never anticipated i mean that was the only time i've ever seen it uh a, a person or a spirit appear in that form uh especially at that age but it was you know i couldn't see him but do I know it was him? Absolutely, I know it was him. I mean, in your heart, you can feel things like that, right? There's, there's, you know, when spirit is communicating something to us, it's not always like seeing. It's a feeling. It's a sense. It's just a, you know, it's a connection to spirit that you can feel it right to the core of your being. And I just knew that the light as she spoke about chess was him. And um, so, I mean, she eventually lost her life. I mean, as she got a little bit older and, 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 and I remember telling her, you know, Nan, you know, make sure you come visit me because I, you know, as soon as you can. And, you know, and because I'm very spiritually connected, I'm like, as soon as she died, I was like waiting like three or four days. I'm like, you're not, you haven't shown up yet, Nan. It actually took a little while. It took, probably took uh, about a month or two. And then oh, I felt wow, her come and sit yeah. on my bed. And, um, and I could see her, her bump print on the bed. 
and I could feel it got really cold. And I said, I know this is you, Nan. I said, I said, but this is amazing. But I, I really kind of want to like to see you. And she just, I just felt her put her hand on me and then move back into the spirit world. I never actually saw her. And uh, it actually wasn't that long ago. She had really finally visited me uh, in a dream. She came to me and my grandma was an amazing lady. And I love spending time with her and, and sharing stories and spirit and culture. She would be telling me about angels. I remember her chasing off spirits with brooms and you know all kinds of things. <laughs> She's all light up in the middle of the hill. At, after watching a horror movie, you know, up on the hill, there'd be some strange light up on the top of the hill. Where did my my grandma would like run up there to see what it was? She's like, okay, I'm gonna go oh, see. Oh wow, what this is. fearless! Yeah. <laughs> Other people are locking themselves in their houses. Two o'clock in the morning, pitch black, but there's some light up on the hill. She's running because she would tell me how she would see lights as a a young girl, and that you know, and sometimes she was told not to follow different lights into the woods because mm -hmm. sometimes they would lead her to like to be lost or things like this. And so there was all these kind of like cultural things. And uh, wow. then she came down. And she says it was nothing. It was just a moon reflecting off a tin can, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> but she, oh, she sounds she brilliant. Awesome. She she was. She was awesome. She's just amazing. I love her so much. I still I still love her so much. And you know, even when she passed, I didn't I didn't go to her funeral. I didn't I didn't attend because I, I I'm not a big fan of funerals to tell you the truth. You know, I know they're they're an honor to people, but you know. The honor and the connection that I have my grandmother was a very personal one. Mm -hmm. And I speak to her. I communicate to her. She will visit me occasionally. not Probably not as often as I would like her to, but she does come. And um, and the visitation that she just had come to me with was pre-Christmas. My mom had gotten some bad news. and um, But before I got the bad news, I had this dream where my grandma, I was in a house. And I don't know what house. I mean, it's irrelevant because a house usually represents you in a dream sometimes. And I was looking out the window and my grandma walked by the window and was like, oh my God, Nan's coming. And she was wearing her red sweater because she had this red sweater that she would never part with. And as she got older and had dementia, one of my mom's sisters had taken it and thrown it in the garbage. It had holes oh, in it. It was patched no. together. And it was like her favorite sweater. And she was like, and then when they they gave her another one, they tried to make her believe that it was this other sweater. Oh, She's like, no. this, oh, this no. is not my sweater. <laughs> Oh, this beautiful and when she came to the house she was wearing that red sweater and it was like pristine uh, it was just pristine and she was like walking up to the door and she was holding something in her hand and it looked like a folder and i'm like oh my god what is she bringing she's bringing me news in a folder and then i woke up i couldn't even i couldn't even make the connection for her to come in the house to tell me because i was so excited that my grandma was coming to visit me but i woke up and i and i told my wife michelle i said michelle my grandma had come to me um, last night and she was bringing news of something. And within a week, my mom, she was in Newfoundland at the time because she still has a house there. And uh, my mom had a call that she something came back on a breast scan. And so my mom had to come back away. They wanted her to come back right away. So they did a biopsy and they did the biopsy and within, because they say, well, we'll call you in two days or, or two weeks or something. And it was actually within 24 hours, they, they called her and said, okay, you have breast cancer. Oh, and, uh, but I felt when I saw the message from my grandma that yeah. it was good news. So I didn't oh, expect, yeah. I was almost like taken okay. back. I was thinking, okay, this is not what I was expecting my grandma because she was bringing me news, but I, I felt in my heart, it was good news. And mm -hmm. I said, mom, I said, you know, whatever happens here. I mean, I feel like, you know, we have to deal with this obviously that, you know, I feel like Nan, had, I told her my dream about Nan and the news that she was bringing. And, and I said, trust me, it's going to be good. It's going to all work out. You need to let go of your fear around this. And my mom was, she has anxiety disorder a little bit. And, you know, she was stressed. She's lonely. She's, she's getting older herself now. I think. And, you know, so she was really struggling with this, with her, with her mortality a bit. Mm -hmm. And I said, you got to stop worrying about this mom, you know, no matter what happens, you're going to be fine, but I really feel this is going to work out. So, um, just after Christmas, she had uh, surgery to remove her breast because there was a, a 12 millimeter oh, size gosh. tumor. And so they removed the breast and then they did a test around the area and, um, and there was nothing. And they said, you know, it was so clear. There was not nothing, nothing in the lymph nodes, nothing there. So we, we don't even think you need chemo. You don't need radiation. 
you know, just, you know, they give her a pill. Uh, I think it's an estrogen blocker pill for five years that I think is kind of standard. And uh, she's having a little bit of trouble with that right now because it's hormonal, obviously. Um, and so it, and, and already battling a little bit of depression. So she's, she's having a hard time of it, but I know she'll work, work it out. But the positive thing is, is she, she's cancer free. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I feel that was the news that my grandma was bringing me, you know, yes. it was, yeah. it was, um, yeah, I was, I was a little bit worried at first, but I knew it was, um, it was good news and it would work out. So you know, our ancestors and, you know, and however you refer to them, whether they're the, the the common ancestors, like your grandparents or great grandparents, or even further back, you know, which I yeah. think most of our guides are too, are people that have been connected to us from, you know, probably many lifetimes. We've lived many lifetimes, not just this one. And our ancestors, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably one of our ancestors uh, ourselves. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Reincarnated. Right. Oh, absolutely. Wow. I mean, sometimes we come through the same family lineage and I even have a whole story around all that, but, um, you know, I, I just, my grandmom is still part of my life. Mm, I still yeah. love her, talk to her. I wish I could play cards with her. And, uh, you know, to, cause I miss that sitting down and, you know, just playing cards with my grandmom. And I remember at the end, how bad her dementia was. She couldn't even remember how to play cards at the end. So yeah. I felt sad. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want her to be here in that form. And and when I saw her in the spirit world where she had visited me, where I, I've asked her like many years ago to visit me and it took her a little while to actually see her, you know, she looked healthy, well, vibrant, her beautiful red sweater on that she just loves. And it was just, it was amazing. And, uh, you know, and I think a lot of people out there think that we have to have this all the time. Right. But I mean, for me in a moment, you know, I can go back to thinking about that moment that I shared with her in the dream. And I can feel that love, that connection, even how healthy she was and vibrant. And I can carry that with me in that moment, you know, every day. Mm. And it's not that it has yeah. to continually happen over and over again. It's, 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 it's pulling in that same vibe when I saw her, when I did mm. that I'll bring with me for the rest of my life. And, and hopefully she'll visit me again in time. Um, I don't put, I don't put time constrictions on things. I just, you know, I ask them to say, you know, when, when it's meant to be, just allow it. Just, you know, just I'm available yeah, and, and yeah. you're always welcome. Just, you know, whenever you need to visit me for whatever, I, I'm available for that visitation. Oh, I love that so much. Wow. It's just so interesting because you've obviously had spiritual experiences from being so young, learning about your heritage having experiences where you've kind of uh, left your body during the night uh, and speaking or meeting your dad when he passed over was obviously something that kind of popped out to me. Would you say that that was the pivotal moment in your journey where you may have suddenly thought, this is happening to me and this doesn't happen to everyone else? <laughs> you know, what was that moment? I, you know what, I didn't think it didn't happen to everyone else. I thought this happened to everyone. Yeah. I, because I didn't have, I didn't talk about those things with a lot of people, just my mom. And uh, when things happen and, and, you know, with the visitation with my father, when I was like 16, I told her <laughs> and, and I thought she'd be like super stoked and happy that my dad, that my dad had come to visit me and, you know, how he looked and the message that he brought and all that. But she was kind of pissed off actually. because <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, why did, why didn't he come to me? Maybe... You and not me. Like, what the hell? I'm the one grieving really hard here. Why is he coming to you? And like, oh. you know, but, you know, she, I, and I think there's a reason for that too, is because, you know, we're all, you know, people grieve differently, you know, and it takes yes. different amounts of time in different places. It's not, they got to wait for you to be ready yeah. because we yeah. have to heal. And when you get to a place of healing and they see they can make the connection, then that's when they will make the connection. And I think my dad, out of unconditional love for her, I'm sure, had needed to give her a lot of space. Yes. Because she yeah. had, I mean, she had, it's hard losing somebody that you care about, that you love unconditionally, right? That you've been married to for 18 years. I mean, it, it's going to take time. It's not something you're going to overcome. And he didn't want to impede in that ability for her to find her feet again or to, to find her balance in life again. And uh, so I know that's the reason why he was giving her that space to do so. She might not like it, but it's the truth. Yeah. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need the time and space to heal before they do make a connection. Yeah. Wow. 
So when you experienced that with your dad, what were the steps after that that kind of led you to do readings, um, you know, and I guess go down this path? <laughs> right. Well, I I would say, you know what, even though what my dad had told me, I thought it was gibberish. I, t I thought, what the hell are you talking about? I'm going to be helping people and, you know, helping people understand this connection. And it just it sounds like silliness. Like I was all literally, I was 16. All I thought about was girls and guitars. <laughs> Music. <laughs> that's all that was all in my mind. Come on, I'm 16. <laughs> but no matter what my dad says, I'm going to be a rock star and, ha and have lots of girlfriends. Who knows? But that's, you know. You know, when you're young men, that's you don't you, you're not thinking in the big picture about life uh, of how things will unfold or or what they are. And I, and I went about my life normally. I never started to take a course or thinking, okay, well, I need to learn about this, or I just went about my merry life. But I think, you know, if you're meant, if things are meant to unfold in a specific way in life, they're going to unfold. It's yes. it's it, there's a plan for you. It's he knew it. There was a plan. I couldn't see the plan. I didn't even know there was a plan. I thought it was all just like. How could he know about where I'm going to be doing and all this? And uh, and and I just went out. I I I met a a lady out in Calgary, Alberta, where I moved to. And uh, I mean, a lot of things even happened to get me there. It's just this is where I see yeah. can I ask? just aligning things. Yes. Can I ask about that? Um, because uh, there was a moment uh, that stood out for me in the book as well about um uh, something that happened on McNabb's Island. Um, just while you were in a mine shaft, and I just it felt to me that again, that like as Liz mentioned, that was another pivotal moment of directing you towards your your heritage and your indigenous culture. That 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 was another course correction or something quite profound that happened. For our listeners who haven't read had the opportunity to read the book yet, can you share a little bit about that experience and why it was so important to you? Well, I've been working as a, a like a spirit talker as a medium for for quite a bit of time at that point in my life, probably about you know ten to thirteen years, like pretty much working full time, like as a as a as a medium. I would still work my day job, but I'd be like uh, you know because my mom had fear about me leaving my day job because she said, well, you you have to have Monday to Friday and you have to have those benefits. The way she grew up, I mean. We all have these little mind viruses that I think have a real job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't be just doing this. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I I was practicing as a medium, and um, and I, I and I, I and I knew who I was as an indigenous person, but I wasn't super connected to my culture in a way that I am now. And I think spirit had a hand in that. They could kind of guide me because I knew it's meant to be part of who I am, and and that understanding and. That pivotal moment in, in that space and time was where I was out then really trying to understand spirit in a great way. Because, I mean, I'm I'm one out there exploring spirit. Because if you want to know if spirit's real, get out there and, ex and, and, and see what's out there. Not just in regards to people on the other side and the dreams and connection. But, it, you know, I've there's earthbound spirits. There's spirits that are still uh, connected to the earth in different places. And I wanted to understand who are these people and why are they here and why are they different? You know, why are they different? So I was part of a few paranormal groups. And one of the ones that we were out exploring, we went to the island of uh, McNabb's Island here in Nova Scotia. And, and Nova Scotia has a super rich cultural history dating back to the 1600s. And because of colonization and, and you know, European people coming and pirates, for God's sakes, were here in the whole nine yards. And, uh, but it, the indigenous people, you know, Shabukto, which is like the harbor of Halifax and in, in that's the big mall word for Halifax Harbor uh, was Shabakto. And uh, so this island, indigenous people lived on. They did. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as more colonization happened, you know, there was few, fewer and fewer places that the Mi'kmaq people that, you know, predominantly uh, populated this whole area could live because they were almost getting moved out to different locations. Yeah. And, you know, there was like conflict and wars on the whole nine yards. So I went to that island and I went there specifically to connect to earthbound spirits because I'd heard that there'd been a few out there and there was a few pirates out there even that I connected to. One of them, I have an amazing voice of, of uh, I can't remember his name, they'll have to tell me that later, but I got a recording of him telling me his, his name as well out there. Wow. But I, I went out wow. to um, Jack. Jack, see, thank you, Spirit. <laughs> I love <laughs> it when they because I need all the help I can get with remembering stuff. And it just, but... Uh, so anyway, I was out there to connect to a few spirits and I went to this place that was an old barracks area. 
for the the 1600s of uh, the English that had uh, taken over the island as well. And when it went down through these tunnel systems, right, there was no outside noise. It was very echoey inside. Though, like you could you could hear a water drop when okay. it dripped. Yeah. It, it would echo in the room. It was just kind of surreal. And then I felt a couple spirits there, and I saw a couple men in in the room that looked like from that time period. Anyway, as I was seeing them. And at the time, I had even had somebody recording, and I wish I had the recording of it because it's gone now because it was amazing. But we were all in pit. It was darkness. We were using night vision the whole nine yards. I couldn't see where the hell I was. And this big ball of light that came down from the ceiling behind me, just a huge orb about this big. Um, and it actually pushed me very hard. And I got, I could feel the hand on me like when it pushed me. And he just spoke to me in Mi'kmaq. He, he, and he just said, I'm Sinogama, which means all my relations, uh, like we're all connected. And wow. he pushed me fairly hard and I could feel his energy move through the room. It's like he could, he just started moving through the room itself. And, and as he moved through the room, you could feel the energy shift and change in the room and you could start to smell burning um, medicine. And now in my culture, indigenous culture, we have what we call smudge, um, which is like yes. four sacred medicines, typically would be sweet grass, sage, tobacco, and cedar. But the, the, the sweet grass and the sage, particularly, you could leave strongly smell in the room. Like somebody had lit a whole bowl of smudge and was like uh, fanning it through the space. Yeah. And everybody wow. actually started to- oh. I know. Because oh they gosh. couldn't breathe. Like they were actually thinking somebody lit something, but nobody had lit anything. And it was like, people were like almost overwhelmed with the smell of the smoke. And he, he, you could feel him move through the space in a clockwise motion. And then the energy of the people that I was connecting to were gone. It was just like they were gone. And he came up to me and he pushed me really hard again. And then the ball of light went right through the ceiling. And I was like, I don't know what the hell just happened here, but I just feel like I just got taught something. And, and you know, I, I knew about smudging, but I didn't know the importance of, of smudge in relation to dealing with energy on the earthbound level. And okay. it's part of our culture to smudge in different ways. You know, we, we smudged just before I came on to speak with you today, I actually smudged, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, we, we always set intentions when we smudge and, you know, and, and, just so you know, I feel like everybody should be smudging with their own medicines, right? You know, whatever medicine in your culture, your region, wherever you are, you know, and it's your words, your prayers that matters. It's not necessarily say, have to say, okay, I'm going to say this enigma to make it yes. powerful, but mm -hmm. it's what your words are, your culture. It's like, it comes from your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm taught with, with indigenous cultures. When, when you smudge and M. Sinogam, all relations, we're all connected. Anyway, we're all family. And uh, so anyway, when we smudge, we always set the intention, like before I came on, you know, creator, help me to know good things in life. Help me to know good things from spirit today. You know, you pull the smoke into your eyes and you say, creator, help me to see good things in life. Help me to very clairvoyantly see the images that need to come through today. You know, you pull the smoke into your ears and you say, okay, creator, help me to hear your voice, hear spirit very clearly and give the messages that I need to. And then you pull it into your mouth and you just say, creator, help me to speak good words today or say what needs to be heard. And then creator, and you yeah. pull it into your heart, help me to feel good things in life, you know, and then you kind of cleanse your, your aura, right? Cause you're, it's like an aura yeah. cleanse of sort, but with the aura cleanse, you're, you're setting intentions and words where you're clearing yourself but you're doing it in a good way for yourself and your yeah. life. You're sending a good, good energy for you in your space, your aura, and, and it's cleansing. But I never knew how powerful it was in connection to moving spirits that may be earthbound. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he was teaching me how to help the spirits that were there. And it was obviously an ancestor or guide or somebody that was coming from the spirit world, an enigma fellow. It seems like a, he was kind of a bit like, I don't want to say rude, but kind of gruff a little bit. Because mm, yes. he really <laughs> wanted to get my attention. He shoved me quite hard. Like it was like, it kind of startled me because, you know, I don't get shoved by spirit very often. But A bit of a wake up me, call. <laughs> it was like, I literally like, I'm a pretty big fellow. And he kind of made me move like pretty good. I was like, okay, why? Well, and then I could feel it and smell the smoke. And, and then again, pushed me hard and, and said something Mi'kmaq and then went through the ceiling. And I was like, okay, I definitely was taught something here. Mm, the spirits I was yeah. trying to connect to gone. And everybody that was there with me was like, what just happened? 
Wow. I mean, yeah. where did the smoke go? Like and all this. And it was just an amazing moment. And it mm -hmm. made me like it, it it energized my ability to learn more about myself as an indigenous person. Yeah, it seemed like such a life changing moment in that. And I love you relaying it here because our listeners like and especially because so much of our listeners are in Australia and, you know, indigenous smoking ceremonies here have become more and more embraced in the normal culture of things like it. Like we're starting to embrace that, that ancient wisdom a lot more here, which is fantastic to see. But also, I guess, for spiritual community, you know, we all go around with our little sage and we'll, you know, sage our rooms. But it's 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 bringing us back to the origins of why these things were important. And I love that you're encouraging us to, um, particularly for me, I'll soon be going back to Ireland. And it's like you're saying, connect with your local medicine. It's like, yeah, instead of taking my sage or Palo Santo, it's like, OK, what's local and indigenous to my region that I can do that ceremony as well? So it's beautiful. Yeah, we all have ancestors. Giving us new ways of thinking. Yes. Yeah. We all have ancestors. You know, it's not just indigenous ancestors that that are super powerful. I mean, I honored that connection because of who I am, but you have ancestors. We all have ancestors. And, you know, wherever you, you're indigenous from somewhere. Yeah. And you yeah. you have to honor your indigenous culture and connection too, and, and your ancestors and what they use to practice in their ceremonies and such. And, you know, we did, there's different ways of approaching spirit in different cultures, but I think it's important that you honor who you are too, because you didn't show up in this life as you are by accident. Yeah. You know, you didn't come in to be you and, 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 and to be someone else. You've came to be you mm -hmm. and you have to honor that fully and, and wholeheartedly. And, you know, it, it, there's a similar connection to all of us. And uh, and when I was taught, it, it, even from like physical elders that I meet in life that I've met oodles of because of my my TV show in Canada called Spirit Talker. But, you know, they, they I see and hear them speak in many different cultures because there's even within indigenous communities, there's different cultures of indigenous people even within canada because there's like there's cree and there's ojibwe and there's you know there's yes. all kinds of different people and they have their own words and their own prayers and their own ceremonies and what i find in common is that they may speak some things in their language but it was really inviting spirit to be with them in the ceremony inviting them to to, to cleanse them and bless the space and room it's it's not it doesn't just apply to Mi'kmaq people or Ojibwe or Cree people or just indigenous people. It applies to us all. And uh, we, we may speak in our own language to do that, but you know, you, you have your language to do that as well. And I say it, it's equally as a powerful and it, it, it's the intention of where you come from that matters. It's your heart. Yes. It's your heart. It's like the word you say, you know, from your heart, you speak it from that space. And when you smudge and, and I tell people, if you want to shift the energy in your space, your room or whatever, you know, have you ever tried smudging? Because I know even with Catholicism or other faiths, you know, they use frankincense. Yes, incense. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not a big subscriber of the whole fear thing, you know, like the power of Christ condemns you for God's sake. <laughs> but it's kind of fearful and negative, right? Because it that's is. medicine too, right? Even the words you speak is medicine. And yes. how you speak, yes. even with your smudge and, and with holy water, I think even with if you look up Dr. Emoto and, and, and even the power of water intentions put in words and water, you know, they yes. hold that. But also the smoke, the smudge that you use holds those words. And that's the power it has when you fill the space or you smudge a space or clear a space. What you speak while you do it and how you feel while you do it is the power. If you just smudge and don't say anything and you feel off or you don't feel right, it's not going to have any power. Yes. It's what you inject into your medicine. And the medicine is the words that you put into the smoke mm. that fills the space in the room. Oh, I love that. I, I just feel like I want to soak in any of these old traditional wisdom. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Ancient one, wisdom. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing I'd love for you to share is that you were given the name. Oh, you tell us the name that you were given, actually. Okay. Um, well, and the Wampai... story around the elder. Yeah. I'll say it in, in my indigenous cultures, Wabak Gipu Aguru Mahajik Jigamahamajik, which means White Eagle Spirit Talker. And uh, and that at this point, because I was really wanting to learn more about my culture, I, I spoke to spirit. I just said, you know, spirit, I would like somebody to come into my life to help me, a traditional elder, because even though that and that one elder that I connected to who, uh, you know, in spirit that made me feel and know the importance of smudging, you know, it was one lesson, but I needed to know more. Mm. And I need a physical person to kind of help me with that. 
And so I put it out to spirit to send me a good person that would help me understand uh, myself deeper as a spiritually connected Indigenous person, as a Mi'kmaq person. And I prayed about it. And that was it. And I did an event in Halifax. It was a charity event back in the day. And it was, and this is where things align that you don't see aligning because I didn't, I didn't go out knocking on doors going, I mean, can you help me learn this? Can you help me learn that? You know, is, yeah. you know, is there one dial one 800 elder? Nothing like that. It's just... <laughs> if only it were that easy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> so you get a trust in the process and, and you just got to wait for it sometimes to kind of like unfold. And uh, so anyway, I did an event in Halifax that was, it was a place called the Veth House and it's for families who were or, or estranged from their children to get together because of legal issues or, or issues within the family. And it's a facilitator to bring families together. So I did a charity event to help um, this organization. They sold tickets and I just came and I did my readings. And anyway, one of the girls I read up on the front row who lost a son, uh, her name was Kathy Martin. And she was, a, she was an elder herself uh, in a different way, um, not necessarily culturally, traditionally, but she was an elder who taught and teaches stories about Indigenous people on film and things like this. So I connected her and I read her. And, uh, and then as I was reading her, I saw something um, that I didn't understand. But I, I, I say whatever comes through, even if I don't understand it, but because I don't always know why these are coming to me. I said, well, I'm seeing four people that were murdered in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia on a hill that seemed like they're very closely related. And I said, they said they, they're connected to somebody named Joe. Do you know Joe? She goes, I met Joe yesterday and he told me this story. I'm like, well, tell Joe if he needs to know more about his grandparents and his great aunt and uncle, I could tell him where their bodies are because I know, I feel like they're missing and I know where they are and they're telling me the story. And she, she, so we got done. And anyway, I, I never thought any more about it. I actually even forgot that I, what I'd said, because I'm so, so I'm in the moment, right. I'm, yeah, I'm doing moment, my thing. Yes. You know, I don't really hang on to things. I think, you know, that was interesting. That was, but I don't like perseverate on it going, I wonder what that meant or whatever. And uh, I just, life went on and about a month or so later, this guy comes knocking on my door and it's an, it's an elder and he's got like a bundle uh, and a bundle in my culture is is, uh, is is medicine that you carry that is wrapped up in a blanket or et cetera, or a trunk or what have you. And he comes in, he says, I heard you want to meet and you need an elder to kind of help guide you in life. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, how the hell did you know where I wow. live and who are you? Knocking on he my goes, door. <laughs> he goes, hi, I'm, I'm Joe. And uh, Joe, really nice man, really good man. And and uh, he's an ex-RCMP officer. Uh, which is a Royal Canadian Mounted Police Officer in Canada, and he's retired and and et cetera, but he's very connected to his culture and helping people learn about that. And so anyway, he comes to my house and I I didn't I don't remember the the meeting at the Beat House. And he starts teaching me about cultural things, teaching me about smudging and how to go about things. And 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 eventually he gives me the name uh, White Eagle Spirit Talker. And and then even he gifted me, I have like a my own bundle. He gifted me the, the wing that he brought, the eagle wing that he brought yes. to my home that day. He eventually gifted it to me. And I still have it right over here on the shelf, uh, wrapped in my, in my own bundle. And then eventually he says, you know, Sean, I, you maybe don't know this, but uh, do you remember Kathy Martin at the, the Beat House that you met? I'm like, oh, well, I don't, I, I don't know her, but I, I remember vaguely meeting her because, well, you don't remember telling her about anything about great grandparents or anything like, like this and missing people. And I'm like, not really. And then, and then I said, okay, maybe I do. I remember saying something. And then I said, Oh, you're the Joe. Um, he goes, oh. I am. I never put it together. Like where yes, it was just, yeah. because I'm again, not thinking about anything. Like, I don't know how the hell he showed up. He just showed up. I thought spirit sent them. It was like, this is, this is insane. like, cause he wouldn't really tell me how he came. He eventually told me. And, um, and it, it was amazing to kind of learn that from him. And he brought me to some sweat ceremonies and different ceremonies. He was a pipe carrier and he taught me about um, the pipe and, and such. And I even think he he thought I might be a pipe carrier eventually. But it's, I mean, the being a pipe carrier in Indigenous culture is a really high honor and privilege that comes with a huge amount of responsibility. And it's not something that I that I can do. I can't facilitate that because it, if anybody calls for you to carry the medicine of the pipe, you have to go and do this. You there is no like, oh, I'm too yes. busy. 
I'm, yeah. I'm in Arizona. You got to go. Like this, okay. this is the response you take on. So the people who are pipe carriers are very, they have particular jobs. And, and a pipe is a, a ceremonial tool for prayers because you're 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 a prayer carrier. And the, the smoke and the ceremony through the prayers of the pipe itself uh, empower the prayer. It's very much like the smudge, just it's celebrated yeah. in a little bit different way, right? But I said, no, no, this is just too big for me. I just, I, that's, I cannot do that. I, 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 there's so much going on in my life. I just, I can't, I can't be that responsible for, for people carrying mm -hmm. this bike. But, you know, eventually I did take him down to Cape Breton. I did have a friend who has cadaver dogs. And because I've, I've worked with, in Canada, I've worked with the police off and on in different things. I, you know, every now and then I, a missing person case. I mean, and, and and I get a lot of people messaging me about stuff. So I get overwhelmed with that sometimes and I can't help everybody, but because I'm, I'm literally like, I could just do that all the time. If I, if mm, I, yeah. but it's heavy energy and it's not something I want to do all the time, but I do it sometimes. And I went there with the cadaver dogs with Joe and, um, and we found a location. I've, I've pinpointed a location of where I felt they were. And then we brought in the cadaver dogs on the, the cadaver dogs were like a hundred feet from where I brought Joe. That's and they indicated under a tree that incredible for probably 80 years and two different dogs. And, and, um, I even seen things in relation to what happened to his, his great grandparents and such. And, and, um, uh, it was, it was sad, but also there was closure mm. because he never really dug up the tree or anything. He just, for, I think they, he had a ceremony with other people there, uh, to honor them because they never, ever received that because they were unfortunately murdered and never found. Yeah, but I'm I'm grateful that I was able to be part of that, and I mean I didn't know any of that was happening. But when when you put out a prayer, like to ask for an elder to come into your life, help or guide you, you know, there's always in 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 culture too. I, I say everything is reciprocal. Like we even with our prayers, we offer medicine, which is tobacco, typically to hear our words. We there's always a reciprocal action. We give something to allow something to come into life. So I feel like spirit had given me the message to help someone to get the teachings I maybe have needed to understand more greater who I, I was as an indigenous person. And that was just the beginning. You know, it's, you know, I've met um, because of uh, in Canada, having the TV show Spirit Talk, which I've just finished uh, filming season five. Yeah. Um, and it will be my final season. And I believe oh, wow. Spirit Talker is playing in Australia, actually. It plays on your indigenous channel there. So oh, you can actually okay. watch it in Australia, I believe. So, and I think the rest of the seasons will probably end up there eventually, but I know they had the first two seasons on the Indigenous channel in Australia playing. Uh, and I'm not sure what the channel is, but I know that you have an Indigenous channel in Australia. NITV, I'm sure it's probably that it's on. I'm going to, I will so. check that we'll out and put it out. in the show notes. We will definitely, because <laughs> sure. yeah, a yeah. lot of people here would like to see that, yeah. And I know it's possible to... To get, to get some clips on YouTube and that as well. So anyone who's interested in Spirit Talk or the TV show, definitely check it out, no matter where you are in the world. Well, you might not find it online, but you'll find you can, if you have a a, a VPN, you can also go to aptnlumi.ca. So aptnlumi.ca. And if you have the VPN and say you're in Canada, I think the first week's free on aptn. You can watch, binge watch all the Spirit Talks you want today. <laughs> But after Absolutely. that, then it, you might have some problems unless you get a new email address and try it all again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love the show to be out there everywhere just because yeah. it's an honor to be able to be connected to spirit. But I just and, and it's not even about me doing it. It's about people yeah. seeing what's possible with connection mm -hmm. to spirit and maybe understanding indigenous people because in the show, uh, the TV show, uh, like every community I go to, I meet different people. And there's always, like I said, this give and take. So mm -hmm. I get to meet people and, and practice some cultural thing. And in return, I do readings for the people in the community. Uh, and, uh, and then I move on to the next community and, and et cetera. And uh, so it's an, I've been blessed to be part of that. And, and, you know, I think it's been amazing. I've been, it answered my prayer of learning about who I am as an indigenous person. I, I think I'd like to just um, talk about yes. your beautiful <laughs> okay. Oracle cards actually here which sure. I ordered, Wisdom of the Elders. These are just beautiful cards, by the way. I actually just want to bring in the subject of animals, the use of animals in um, your culture and in many cultures of the world, because I found it really interesting 
that you were given this wing and then the stories around you then using your spirit animals and calling them in and then the validation that came and the stories that came from doing that were incredible so then to get this beautiful deck and see things like the turtle and the bear and the beautiful animals that you've used in these cards was just beautiful but I'd love you to share maybe one of those stories around the use of your spirit animals Okay. Well, there's one story particularly that will stand out and, and I'm and I'm wearing it now and I'll kind of lead you up to it in a sense because I was connected to the eagle in, in, in Mi'kmaq, we say Gipu, which means eagle. Well, back Muun is, is the white bear. And I had a dream of a medicine that came to me because animals carry energetic medicine. Actually, this is my next book. You probably don't know this yet, but I'm literally signing a two book deal with Hayos. And the first book is about a totem animal guidebook. Ah, and amazing. That's what I'm writing about next. And then I told him the story. And I think that's probably why it's because of the story that I told him. You know, you don't always know the animal medicine that it, you're meant to carry in life. And I knew about the eagle because I have a deep connection to the eagle and the wing being gifted to me, my name, White Eagle, Spirit Talker. And I, I believe we actually we have probably four sacred animals that come to us at different stages of life, just like guides. You know, at different stages of life, you will probably receive four guides through life, like one very early on, one in your youth, one in your adulthood, and one when you're in your elder age. I feel like they come, because we we, we use, utilize the medicine wheel too in the four directions. And, you know, four is a sacred number to indigenous people. And there's different stages of life from, you know, being an infant to youth, to adult, to elder. And I feel like at different phases of life, these, you know, these different animal medicines will come to you. And I don't know how they're going to come to me. And, and there's been ceremonies in the past where you could go out and have visions and things like that, uh, where you go off in the woods by yourself for four days and, you know, you uh, have no food or water and you just uh, pray. You do a sweat before you do it. You After you're done, you do a sweat. And at some point you're, you're in between the spirit world. <laughs> Predominantly you're having visions and things are really like profound. Uh, but this didn't happen that way. I, I, I had a dream one night that I was in a field and I remember for whatever reason, there was these shadows of seven people that were chasing me and I didn't know why the shadows were chasing me I didn't know who they were I just knew that there were people and there were shadows so I tried to outrun these seven people and as I was running through the field um, they were running after me and I, I was running as fast as I could I could see the trees and I knew if I could get to the trees I would be safe so I got about two about three quarters of the way and on the other side of the field these polar bears came out of the woods and, and I was like, okay, great. Now, I not only do I have to outrun people, I have to outrun polar bears, for God's sakes. I could probably outrun the people. I said, I'm running the other way. <laughs> <laughs> like barely in the dream, just, just giving her as hard as I can. I, I might have passed one or two of them, but then they were running too. And at some point, I could feel the polar bear's breath behind me. And I was like, I just had to surrender. I just had to say, well, I guess if this is how it's supposed to end, this is how it's supposed to end. And I just stopped. And I just, I surrendered to the polar bears that they were going to overtake me. And they all ran past me. And the seven shadows that were in the field that were trying to do me harm or hurt, they kind of just pounced on them. And they pounced on each shadow, uh, each seven of the bears. And as they did, because they were kind of black shadows, they weren't real people, they were just figurative in a sense. And they would disintegrate, they would just disappear. And then all polar bears turned around and walked into want to be one bear. And the bear stared at me. And I woke up, I'm like, Oh, my God, the polar bear wasn't there to hurt me. The polar bear was there to yes. protect me. Uh, wow. And I'm like, and I was like, Oh, my God, polar bears are with me, polar bear medicines with me. And so I was so inspired by that dream and i was like it was so profound and vivid and, and clear i i i said you know creator if the polar bear is medicine that i'm meant to carry if it's part of my life and my spirit and my totem animals then i need you to find a way to send me something particular i said i'm asking for a polar bear claw i don't know how you're going to get it to me but i i need you to find a way and so anyway i i i 
months had gone by and 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 I started thinking, okay, well, this is not going to come. <laughs> and you know, my humanness got out of the way. I'm like, okay, I'm on, yeah, I'm on now uh, eBay and uh, you know, looking for gold plated polar bear claws. Just <laughs> like, and I'm like, and this voice in, in my head goes, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and trying to I, force I, it <laughs> I can't do this and I, I tell my wife I'm like I can't just buy a pull it would be it'd be cheesy I'm like I can't do this I just have to let it go and I, I let it go and then uh probably about within a, a short time after that uh, I got a parcel a little parcel in the mail a little box and um so the little the, the box came in the mail and it was from a lady in Newfoundland, where my mom is from, and she's part of my my course and things like this. And she was just in Labrador, Newfoundland, which is another part of part of Canada, and not even connected to the the other part because Newfoundland is an island. Yes. And she was there, and she met some Inuk elders, which were like from that region, the indigenous people from there, and very connected to polar bears and seals and 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 all that. And she said, she she wrote me a note and she put it in the little parcel. And she said, Sean, I was just in Labrador and I met with an elder there and he gifted me two gifts. He gave me two polar bear claws. And he said, this one's for you, Barbara. He said, but this other one is for someone else. And you're meant to give it to someone else. But you'll know who this person is it's meant for. And she went home and she thought about it. And she said, you know, the only person I could think of was you, Sean. She said, I felt that maybe I should send you this. And she says, I don't know if you you, you need this or, or if this is something you've asked for from spirit, but I'm sending it to you. And I opened it up and it was the polar bear claw. So oh I carried my it this today. <laughs> and I was oh. like, I, I cried. I mean, it's massive. And uh, so anyway... A short time after that, I had a little gathering at my house and and I didn't tell anybody about the claw or my request or anything like this. And another lady came and she does uh, she's another Mi'kmaq person locally and she was doing some taxidermity and uh, her name was Lori Curdo. And she came with a little present for me and she said, I just was working on a bear rug the other. She said it was so strange. It was a polar bear rug. She said, I had this little piece left over and I thought I should bring it to you and just gift it to you. You, maybe you need to have this. And so I she gifted me this wrapped in red cloth, little piece of polar bear fur. Now it's what I put my smudge bowl on. And yeah. uh, so now I have another part of a polar bear. Within a very short time after that, I get a call from another lady. And I don't even do personal sessions anymore just because of my my time schedule and just being busy and just on the go all the time, literally. And and she kind of like found a way to get a hold of me. I don't know how she found a way to get a hold of me, but she did. And she said, you know, me and my mom could really use a session. I said, well, I don't do them. I can reference you to somebody that I know, mm -hmm. like for a personal session. I have a lot of students. I could reference you to somebody particularly. And she goes, she goes, but I, I, I really like to see you. And I said, okay. And she said, well, you know, I, and we don't have a lot of money. And I said, well, I, I mean, I really don't even do personal readings for money anymore just because I'm just too busy. And, you know, I, I'm doing good in life. I don't, I don't need to accept money in return for, for sessions. And uh, she goes, but I do have something that might interest you. She goes, I've had this polar bear rug in my closet for like 25 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> Triple goes, validation. I, I, I just pulled it out the other day and I just was thinking about who I could gift this to. And I thought, well, maybe Sean would do this for a reading. Um, and, I, and she called me. She says, if I gift you this, would you do a session for me and my mom? I'm like, um, uh, yeah. Beautiful exchange. No Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So oh, the, wow. the, the the story now, I mean, very powerful. Obviously, affirmation like beyond belief. Like I don't know how many other people are getting pieces of polar bear showing up in their life. I mean, I don't know how many the people that could have... you cannot <laughs> exactly, deny that. Like just randomly people sending you things like for whatever reason they think about you and say, Okay, well, here nobody sent me any other piece of any other animals, but just polar bears. Yeah, and that's uh, so obviously it's medicine I need to carry. And I, I have this belief because in the vision, in the dream, I saw seven polar bears. And seven, again, is we, we have seven directional teachings in digital culture. Seven is also a very spiritual number. But right now I have three parts of three different bears. I have a feeling one day I'll have seven parts of seven different bears that will come to me yeah. and i feel like they already knew who i was before I even i even feel like in the dream that the bears that were there these are pieces of them 
they are them. Oh, I feel gosh. like that we we have been connected before this life, and they're finding ways to to share their spirit and their medicine with me today. And I only have three, and I feel like four more will come to me somehow. Who knows? Someone listening to this podcast may it may. Well, may I don't want to. Prop, I, I'd rather it not, not be like that. I'd rather no, it no, be but I mean, it like could, it could prompt for people, so it's not like, oh, let me rummage through my stuff and see if I have. To have. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but it, who knows? Things go out into the world and come back to us in the most extraordinary ways. And I know through reading your book, it seems like so much stuff comes to you and you're you know we talk about surrender we talk about patience on the spiritual path but it's like when you do have that and we don't try to force things we don't go looking for the gold bear claw on amazon no like exactly wait for, but... things, wait for things to <laughs> but come we all have that little this. human egotistical little mind yep. virus in there right <laughs> yeah and, and we know that that's the lesson it's like how often are we doing that because I can think of 10 times at least this week where I've gone in and tried to force something rather than have patience just wait it's coming <laughs> yeah oh, yes absolutely. absolutely I mean it doesn't mean that you don't follow through on things sometimes in, in certain of things course. right because I've even been taught that that you know when you have a vision or a goal or dream or desire that you keep going you don't give up you know even though you've surrendered you know, sometimes you have to take an extra step or two just to kind of manifest things. And, uh, but that's the way it's meant to kind of like unfold. And, and even it, like, I could go on and on and on, just, you know, I have like a trillion <laughs> stories. But it's I, just the I, beauty I of life. the magic. Oh, yeah, so right. Good. It's just, life is so amazing. And when yeah. you start to become aware of that, on like how everything connects and how everything is coming together, even when you don't see it sometimes, it's just amazing. I'm just, I'm so in awe. I mean, I, living the life that I have, I couldn't see life any differently. It's just impossible. It's impossible. I mean, not to mention that I, I mean, I know spirits around because I, I record them sometimes talking to me. So I know they're, they're there. It's not, I'm not like a psychic ventriloquist. They're, they're really there. <laughs> there's, there's, there's voices there that I can record sometimes that are saying different things to me off and on. And, and um, that's even, and, and speaking of guides, that's how I learned about another guide was that way i actually did a little gathering and in, in, of uh, people and and we were doing almost like a, a spirit circle and i just sat around and just inviting spirit and it was for a different reason but i always record like i, I have a digital recorder like i have a few uh different digital recorders but whenever i'm doing something where i'm talking to spirit about a case or things like that where i've been out with the police i bring my recorder because I, sometimes even when i'm out doing things i'll have the spirits talk to me Mm -hmm. while i'm out there and i'll actually have a recording of them saying things to me and uh and, and that's actually happened uh so many times it's insane like not all the time but sometimes yeah. mm -hmm. and uh and i always use that and i and i and i i learned about a new guide that way uh because i heard my guides talking on the recorder to each other <sighs> and, Victoria. and then i heard them talking to somebody named eliza i'm like who the heck's eliza <laughs> and or Lisa. They, they, one one person called her Lisa. The other person called her Eliza. So I don't know if it's Eliza or Eliza. But either way, there's another guy over there named Eliza, and um, that's working with me. And I I I've met her once, and uh, I know she's there. I don't know what role she plays, but obviously she's there. They're consulting to her, so I don't know why they're consulting her. She may be like a, you know, somebody who's on the council or somebody who's like a like a master guy on the other side. Who knows? I I don't know everything. I just know mm -hmm. that you know. In the spirit world, they 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 consult with each other. They they work together. I mean, your team, your ancestors, your your spiritual guides, they're helping us through life and to express and be who you are. Uh, your loved ones are helping you in different ways, and you know, with that connection of life and and you know, connection to maybe you know, hearing bad news or good news in regards to family and such. But you know, we're all connected, and it's an amazing gift to be aware of that. Yeah, and absolutely it, it, and even though you know i'm psychic or a spirit talker a medium whatever you want to call whatever language that you choose to use you know honor you honor your connection honor your divine connection speak to your people like you know have your own ceremonies where you talk to them and honor that connection that you have and you'll start to see how things line up more greater in your life because when you start to engage in spirit spirit starts to engage with you and Beautiful. it's, it's, mm. you know, it's don't, don't think I have to give you the proof, find the proof yourself, you know, find it because it will come to you as well. And then you won't be able to see life differently. 
any differently either. It'll be just like, this is amazing. And like, how, how come I haven't been living this way my whole life? Right. Yeah. And on that note, Sean, how, so connection to spirit, but how can people connect with you? So people who are, you know, obviously your book, your TV show, your Oracle cards that, um, that Liz will, will share all of that information on the show notes, but what's the best way for people to get in contact and stay in contact with you? Well, if you, if you want, you can always follow me on Facebook, Indigenous Medium Sean Leonard. Uh, also, my website, Sean-Leonard, S-H-A-W-N-L-E-O-N-A-R-D.com is my website. And if you're interested in the book and the links and stuff, they're on my website too. And uh, you can always go there and get them. And and uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Sean. Your stories are super interesting and yeah, I can't wait for the next book, to be honest. I'll be probably one of the first to yes. buy. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I'll be signing awesome. up to your newsletter. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you know it. You're you're actually the first people I've announced this to publicly. Oh, there we uh, go. Oh, the fantastic. Subject, a spiritual so. as fuck exclusive. We love there it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Well, thank Love you your so name, much. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks again, Sean. It's been in- incredible. And um, yeah, we can't wait to have you back. That's it for another episode. Thank you for listening. Did you know that we are building a movement of 1 million people who are spiritual as fuck? We would love for you to join us. You can start by leaving us a review on Apple Podcast. Every month, I'm going to intuitively choose one person and do a psychic reading for you. So follow us on Instagram, send in your stories and topic suggestions and join the movement at spiritual.a.f. Until next time. This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose.